Suppose that the visual field data sheet discloses focal defects as you see here. To use these data to localize the lesion within the visual pathway, you must determine the pattern of the defects in both eyes. The anatomic explanation for these defect patterns is covered in the videos entitled Vision Pathways Parts 3, 4, and 5. Here are the choices. Non-localizing focal defects, nerve fiber bundle defects, and hemianopic defects. Non-localizing focal defects lack the features of hemianopic and nerve fiber bundle defects. They are disappointingly unhelpful in locating a responsible lesion. But look carefully at the optic fundus to make sure there is not a visible abnormality that corresponds to the focal visual field defect. If there is no visible fundus lesion, you are stuck without an explanation unless you were wrong and the focal defect is actually part of a nerve fiber bundle defect or hemianopic defect. Now look for those localizing visual field defects. Nerve fiber bundle defects come from lesions of the optic nerve or nerve fiber layer. They have the following shapes. Central or centrocecal scotomas. These scotomas indicate damage to the maculopapular bundles. When they appear in both eyes, they are especially characteristic of toxic, nutritional, or hereditary optic neuropathy. This is an arcuate and an altitudinal scotoma. It indicates damage to the bundles that originate in the temporal retina that arch over and under the maculopapular bundles to enter the superior and inferior poles of the optic disc. These defects occur especially in ischemic optic neuropathy, but also in inflammatory, compressive, and glaucomatous optic neuropathies. This is a temporal wedge scotoma. It indicates damage to the retinal bundles that originate in the nasal retina and travel radially into the nasal portion of the optic disc. This defect is uncommon, occurring particularly in congenitally dysplastic optic neuropathies. Now look for hemianopic defects, which are defined as having defect borders aligned to the vertical meridian of the visual field. Decide if a hemianopic defect is present in the temporal visual fields of both eyes, a so-called bitemporal hemianopia, which is the signature of a chiasmal area lesion. Besides the classic bitemporal hemianopia, there are two other visual field patterns of chiasmal area lesions. First, there is the unilateral temporal hemianopia in one eye and a normal visual field in the other eye. This combination spells a lesion in front of the chiasm in the intracranial part of the ipsilateral optic nerve. Then there is the temporal hemianopia in the field of one eye and a nerve fiber bundle defect in the other eye. This hybrid pattern of hemianopic defect and nerve fiber bundle defect spells a lesion at the junction of the optic nerve and optic chiasm. If the clusters of high threshold points lie on the same side of visual space in both eyes and have borders aligned to the vertical meridian, you will be diagnosing a homonymous hemianopia. This pattern is the signature of a retrochiasmal lesion lying somewhere between the optic tract and the visual cortex. A complete homonymous hemianopia, such as you see here, does not allow you to decide where within the retrochiasmal visual pathway the lesion lies. On the other hand, an incomplete homonymous hemianopia permits you to refine your localization. You will do that by looking for one of the following 11 patterns that localize retrochiasmal lesions. Number one, this is an incongruous homonymous hemianopia defined by the fact that the defects in the two visual fields are not of the same size and shape. This pattern localizes the lesion to the optic tract. Many lesions occur there, especially masses and inflammation. Number two, this is a congruous homonymous hemianopia. It is defined by the fact that the defects in the two visual fields are of the same size and depth. 
This pattern localizes the lesion to the far posterior optic radiations or visual cortex. Many lesions occur here, especially strokes and tumors. Number three, these are pie in the sky defects. They have one border aligned to the vertical meridian and the other border extending radially into the superior visual field. This pattern localizes the lesion to Myers loop in the anterior temporal lobe. The most common cause of these defects is a temporal lobectomy for intractable epilepsy. Number four. This is a superior homonymous quadrantinopia. It is defined by the fact that the defect borders are aligned to the vertical and horizontal meridians in the superior visual field. This pattern localizes the lesion to the inferior visual cortex. The most common cause of these defects is stroke. Number five, this is an inferior homonymous quadrantinopia. It is defined by the fact that the defect borders are aligned to the vertical and horizontal meridians in the inferior visual field. This pattern localizes to the superior visual cortex. The most common cause of these defects is stroke. Number six, these are homonymous paracentral scotomas. They are defined as hemianopic defects restricted to the central degrees of the visual field. This pattern localizes to the far posterior visual cortex and the most common cause is stroke. Number seven, this is macular sparing homonymous hemianopia. It is defined as hemianopic defects that spare the central five to 10 degrees of the visual field. This pattern localizes the lesion to the anterior visual cortex and the most common cause of these defects is again stroke. Number eight, this is a temporal crescent defect. It is defined as a monocular defect that involves only the peripheral crescent of the temporal field. This pattern localizes the lesion to the far anterior visual cortex. This is a rare defect and is probably most often caused by stroke. Number nine, this is a temporal crescent sparing homonymous hemianopia. It is defined as a homonymous hemianopia that spares the peripheral crescent of the temporal field. This pattern indicates that the lesion did not damage the anterior visual cortex. The most common cause again is stroke. Number 10. This is the hourglass homonymous hemianopia characteristic of a stroke of the lateral geniculate body caused by occlusion of the anterior choroidal artery. This defect is rare. Number 11. This defect is the silhouette of the hourglass homonymous hemianopia. It is also characteristic of a lateral geniculate body stroke, this time caused by occlusion of the lateral posterior choroidal artery. This defect is also very rare. As challenging as this localizing process may be, an even more challenging task is figuring out the cause of the constricted visual field. For that, turn to the next video called Dealing with the Constricted Visual Field.